In the previous video, we took a look at the science background of why exactly we're engaged in a campaign to launch rockets in the high arctic. Now we'll take a look at the mission specifics. We call this rocket C-REx-2. It stands for Cusp Region Experiment Number 2. The first C-REx launched from Andoya Space Center in 2014, exploring the same science problem, and C-REx-2 is a follow-up. C-REx-2 is a four-stage rocket, meaning there are four boosters which will fire in sequence. Above the boosters is the payload section, carrying the science experiments as well as telemetry and attitude control. Let's take a closer look at the payload section. As I mentioned in the last video, C-Rex 2 is designed to carry scientific instruments into the cusp density anomaly to help us understand what supports the anomaly. The science payload consists of four MPIs to measure the three-dimensional plasma drift motion, ERPA to measure the distribution of low-energy thermal electrons, EPLAS looks at the distribution of higher-energy auroral electrons, TIGTOF will be used to measure the types of ions present up there. PIPs can measure the density and temperature of the ions. A magnetometer will measure field-aligned electric currents. And a set of pyrotechnic tracer cloud subpayloads used to measure the strength and direction of neutral winds and plasma drift. More on those in a moment. All of this stuff is neatly packed into the payload section of the rocket. And here's a photo of the payload section during the build process at NASA Wallops Flight Facility. People sometimes get the impression that sounding rockets are small, but you can see that's not necessarily the case. And remember, this is just the payload. It's only a fraction of the total vehicle. Back to the tracer subpayloads. These are small, rocket-powered canisters that fly out of the main payload at predetermined times. The canisters are ejected from tubes with spirals cut into them to stabilize the canister by spinning it. It's a lot like a bullet fired from a rifle, except that it has a rocket motor on it and an explosive inside. Once the canister is flown out and separated from the main payload, it will detonate to atomize the contents. Most of the containers are filled with a mixture of barium and strontium metal pellets along with a thermite powder. Some of the barium is immediately ionized when exposed to sunlight. The ionized barium emits purple light and moves in response to the presence of electric fields. Tracking its motion from the ground tells us about the electric fields and the motion of ionospheric plasma. The remaining non-ionized barium, combined with the small amount of strontium added to the canisters, creates a neutrally charged cloud that travels with the wind while emitting a green light, fading to purple. Tracking its motion tells us about the high altitude winds. Over a period of about half an hour, all of the tracer clouds will burn up and dissipate. The video you're watching here was taken during the C-Rex 1 campaign in 2014, and you can see all this playing out. The barium ions form long, ray-like structures, similar to the aurora, and seem to change direction halfway through the experiment as the otherwise invisible electric fields dictate their course, while the neutral barium strontium clouds turn into puffy balls that slowly spread out and fade away. Here's another video of a similar experiment that was flown in April of this year on a mission named Azure. Since the anomaly we are studying occurs within the polar cusp, we need a far north launch site. Because the anomaly occurs on the day side of Earth, we need to launch around noon. But because the tracer clouds need to be observed against a dark sky, we need the sky to be dark at noon. Put these things together and you find why we have come to launch from Andoya Space Center and observe from Svalbard, where it is quite dark at noon in winter. Our mission setup looks like this. C-Rex 2 will be launched from Andoya Space Center in Norway. There we will have a NASA launch team as well as the science mission leaders watching the data and calling the shots. Clemson University's Chi rocket, also carrying a pyrotechnic tracer payload, will launch from Neolison on Svalbard shortly after C-Rex 2, weather permitting. Telemetry antennas at Andoya and Neolison will track and download data from the rockets in real time. C-Rex 2 will release a constellation of tracer clouds from around 200 to 400 kilometers altitude over the Greenland Sea, while Chi will puff tracer clouds along its path like a dotted line. Ground observers will use cameras to track the tracer clouds from Shell Henriksen Observatory at Longyearbyen and from the Rabin Lab at Neolisand. And an observer aboard a NASA Air B-200 aircraft flying over the Greenland Sea will also track the tracer clouds. Why do we have multiple camera sites? In order to pinpoint the location of a tracer cloud, you have to look at it from two different locations and correlate those two different sight lines against each other. It's the same thing as old school map and compass triangulation, or how your brain gets depth perception by using the input from both of your eyes. The third observing site is there to provide backup in case one of the sites is blocked by clouds. Well, I think that more or less covers it. We are currently in the launch window and hoping to put the rockets in the air any day now. We will try to keep you all updated as the campaign progresses. Thanks and fingers crossed.